welcome to Leadership 2019 again, uh, and welcome to this first presentation segment. My name is Alice Mann. My title for this first part of the presentation, We Just Can't Do This Anymore, Smaller Congregations Facing Choice Points. So I've been working in and with smaller congregations since 1974. Don't calculate. <laughs> Um, initially within the Episcopal Church, I'm an Episcopal priest, but over time with churches and synagogues in many different streams of tradition. And today I sit in the pew in a small Episcopal Church in the medium-sized city of Haverhill, Massachusetts, one of the old mill cities of the Merrimack Valley. So, just so you know what's coming, I'm going to be presenting some conceptual frameworks that are really here just to help you organize your thinking, a place to hang things as you collect them, um, and also perhaps to expand your image of, of a range of options. The frame might be a little bigger than the one that you came in with, or not, it might be smaller. Um, I'll also, about various options, be offering some, some pros and cons, some costs and benefits. And those come from people like you over the years that I have either sat in the pew with or worked with uh, in teaching and consulting situations, and what they've told me about living with some of these options. And then the third thing that will be happening, I'll be inviting you to use some assessment tools right on the spot. And you're going to have, a, have time to taste them and to capture maybe a few initial thoughts that that particular tool might elicit. But you'll probably at some point find yourself frustrated that you didn't really finish. And that's purposeful because they're really not for here only, but for at home when you have, you know, when you pick out one that you thought was provocative and you say, I'm going to spend an hour with this and I'm just going to see what I get out of it and maybe having experimented with yourself, yourself um, you're going to say, I'm going to ask three or four leaders in this church to sit with me. I'm not going to tell them what I got out of it. No, no, no. That's your learning. You're going to ask them to go through the experience from the beginning and kind of explain what this is and ask them to do the assessment. And then all together, you can arrive at a conversation that is now fresh and new because you've all done it together. You're not reporting anything from the past. You're right there with them in the present. So please remember, uh, you have all been at meetings where somebody tried to tell somebody else what they learned at a conference. Right? <laughs> it's horrible for the listeners and it's horrible for the speaker because you can see they're not getting it. <laughs> um, it's just the way it is. So, with all of this, think about what you can take back so that they can begin at their starting point and use tools, the video, whatever is going to be helpful to you um, to have their own conversation. That's what's going to help uh, set the stage for change. In your packet, um, you've probably already come to the pages uh, for the PowerPoint. And we've set these up uh, with space next to each slide for you to take notes. Uh, I would caution you, please don't try to write down everything I'm saying. It's going to be on the video. <laughs> and furthermore, think this thought. It's actually not all for you. Your trick is to find the part that is for you, right? And so uh, what I would like you mostly to do in those on those pages is note down reactions, you know, wow, we might be able to do this, or maybe you'll put a big star next to something, look at this again. Um, you can deface the page, you know, circle things, X things out, I hate this, why did she mention that? We talked about that once, it created enormous conflict, ah, get rid of that, you know. I, that's what's actually most helpful is because you, you are tracking your own reaction, including perhaps some things you're blocking out that when you go back and look, you might ask yourself, 
now that I think, of, do I actually want to exclude that? And you might have good reasons for doing so, very good reasons. Or you might say, you know, um, I could be a stumbling block if I just keep ruling that out without even really thinking about it. Um, or thinking about how we might do it differently this time. Right? So uh, that's just a suggestion about how to make use of that printed material. So with that, let's start. I, I tend to frame this work wherever I go with the word smaller congregations. So what in the world do I mean by smaller? Um, and there's really two parts of that. There's a numbers part of that conversation, and there's a dynamics, social dynamics part of that conversation. And they're related, but they're not identical. <laughs> and so it's really important to think about both parts of it, because uh, sometimes the numbers and the dynamics don't quite match up, and uh, that can create tensions. So just to be aware of that. So I'm about to put up a question, and I'd like you to imagine that I have just phoned you up. And uh, so imagine that you're in the US, and you're just getting a telephone call from something called the National Congregation Survey, which gathered data not by looking in the phone book for the names of congregations that were official enough to put in an ad. We don't have phone books anymore. <laughs> that don't have a website or a Facebook page. Let's put it that way then. They went with a random sample of the population. So you're being phoned up just by, by virtue of being a resident of your community. And they start out by asking, you know, is there some kind of congregation, religious community that you are part of, by whatever definition you choose to use? And if so, can you tell me, da da, how many persons, counting both adults and children, would you say regularly participate in the religious life of your congregation, whether or not they're officially members of the congregation? And as a surveyor, I am not going to answer any questions about what that means. The interpretation is all up to you. So I would like you, if you have a pencil or pen handy, I want, want you to write down a number next to that slide. Without consultation, I would like you to write down your own number. <laughs> Might be interesting to see how people from the same congregation report differently. Everybody got a number? I found that not an easy question to answer about my own congregation. It would have taken me some time. OK, so they put that together in a big, complicated report. And uh, the best chart I could find, I'm going to ask you a question about yourself in a minute, but the best chart I could find, they, they did this survey in 1998, 2006 and 7, and 2012. Um, and so there's three columns of numbers you know, for each of those years of what percentage of the congregations mentioned were in different size categories. Right? That's what we're looking for in, in all that complexity. Um, and what I would like you to uh, notice here, especially is the top line, which refers to congregations with 50 or fewer, and in 1998, that was almost 38% of US congregations, all, all types, any kind of affiliation, any faith tradition. So this is a, an exceedingly broad study. Um, so 38% more or less. In 2006 and 7, uh, again, 38% yes. very similar. But by 2012, it was 42, almost 43%. And now this is already some years ago, so I would have a prediction about which way that line continued to go, which is up. That is to say, more and more US congregations have 50 or fewer participants based on that definition that I gave you. Uh, the next cohort, 50 to 100, 
um, was fairly stable over that time. And all the other size cohorts, the number of congregations in each of them was going down. So larger congregations in the US are becoming less prevalent, and smaller congregations are becoming even more prevalent, even though they already were a very significant part of our US landscape. Now remember, we're talking about numbers of congregations, completely different conversation than numbers of people. Yeah. Okay, so just, just, just keep that straight. We're just talking about numbers of congregations. Uh, the bottom line, the main thing I want you to notice here is that in the US, more than two-thirds of congregations had fewer than 100 participating regularly in the religious life of the congregation. So is that similar to here in Canada, and is that similar to here in BC? Uh, regarding British Columbia, let me ask you, how many of you think that number would be lower, that there would be fewer small congregations here than in the US? One, two, okay, it could be true. I, no, I certainly don't know the answer to that myself. Uh, and how many of you think it would be a larger number? A lot. And how many of you think it would be about the same? Another, you know, maybe a quarter-ish, yeah. And that's not an answer you actually need, except to know what you probably already know, which is uh, uh, smaller congregations are a dominant feature of church life, and we better get good at being them, talking about them, resourcing them, um, and um, allowing them to be the mustard seed that they're supposed to be. Right? All right, so we've talked about numbers, but the other half of the story, or maybe even more than half, is dynamics. And I just want to briefly refer you to a book, um, the content of which I think is really, really excellent. Um, Gary McIntosh, One Size Doesn't Fit All. But he really talks about how the dynamics typically changed, changed based on congregational size. It's a, just a very good resource, and it, it's, it's easy to follow. And the chart is the kind of thing you could put in front of a committee meeting or a parish uh, council meeting or you know, wherever that would be appropriate in your congregation. And you could walk them through some key parts of it and point to parts of it, and I think it would kind of make sense to people. It's put in pretty simple terms. So I'm going to highlight just a few of the key points of, about smaller congregations that I've drawn from Macintosh and, of course, from my own experience. So how smaller congregations operate. And the first word to have in mind, I think you already know this, but we'll underscore it, is they are relational. To me, the bottom line of that is the kitchen table is more influential than the board table. And if you forget that, especially as a minister, you're cooked. <laughs> That's the nicest way I can say that. OK. Um, the circle of connection is everything in the smaller congregation. And anything that does not arise from that and gain support from that is not going to last long. Um, closely related to what I just said, they tend, to, sociologically, they tend to be what's called a single cell system, um, an extended family that have been in the same community for a while, might be this size, possibly. Now, this little graphic, it, it happens to be children, but imagine those are people of different ages. It, it has 35 people in it, and I thought that was quite interesting, that the number of figures that fit into that graphic circle is just about the number of relationships that the average person can navigate in a group. Which is to say, in a group of 35, you know, given a little, a little time, I can feel like I kind of know who everybody is, and I can spot a newcomer the minute they show up. You, you, you can somehow hold, hold that in your head in a very kind of natural way. It's one of the natural sizes of human units, is that 30, 35-ish range. And of course, it can be smaller, it can stretch larger, but uh, that's sort of the comfortable size for it. Um, so it may be single cell in this sense, 
that every single person would instantly recognize a newcomer. Let's just use that as a benchmark. Or it can be a, a small multi-cell system that is a few networks, which may be relatively small themselves, arranged around a relational anchor. So, especially in the 50 to 100, even the 50 to 200 range, but let's say in the 50 to 100 or 150 range, um, often if there's some continuity to pastoral leadership, that's often expected to be the pastor. And it sounds like this. Um, let's see, where's, uh, where, where's Trina in the room? Uh, there, we, there we go, there's Trina. So imagine we've, we've just had a worship service with um, 75 people in it. Well, actually, hey, well, what, what, we got, what, 90 in the room right now, something like that? So you're it, you're the worship service, right? And um, somebody comes up to me afterward, up to me afterward, Trina comes up to me afterward and says, who, who was that person in the back row? I'm supposed to know the answer. Maybe. Now, that's, that's if the congregation has an experience of pastoral continuity. That's not everywhere, of course. So if that's not the case, um, it, it, there is probably a layperson among you who is the one that, you would, that Trina would go to. She wouldn't come to me as the pastor because she knows I probably wouldn't know. I haven't even gotten to know all of you yet. Um, but whoever that is, maybe it's Leanne, they're going to say, Leanne, who was that person? And if Leanne doesn't know now, Leanne will know within an hour. <laughs> no, and this is really important. I mean, this, you know, this is not in any way disparaging. In a system this size, there has to be a person, a few people. I mean, ideally, it's not all on a single person's shoulders, that there's a, a small team at the center of the life of this system um, who pay attention to these things and who take care of the human life of the system. Um, and so wh whether that's the pastor or key elders or maybe a team, oh boy, small churches do work well when, a, I, mean, I mean elder in a generic sense, in quotation marks, a person with an inherent eldership um, in the system. Um, when the pastor and that person or couple of people can really be a team, um, lots can happen that's healthy and, and productive. And so the, the, the key circles, you know, maybe the Smith family, maybe there's a founding story that has something to do with the Smith family, or maybe just at a certain point in the life of this town, the Smith family took over the church. I mean, you know, there were just a lot of them, and one brought the next, and they had children and grandchildren, and they kept coming. So the next thing you know, one of the key circles in the church are people related to the Smiths. You know, people marry in and all of that. That's the Smith clan. And boy, you better know what's cooking in the Smith clan, right? And then the choir, which might have four people, it might have ten people, but it kind of has its own life and its own network of relationships with the community even. They go do concerts or whatever, participate in concerts. Um, and then maybe there's a little Sunday school group, and typically some of the elders may not know the kids when, when you're in this size, this slightly larger small church, uh, but they certainly expect one or two adults who head that to know all about those families. Um, and so on. And so something has to hold those networks together because they don't necessarily all fully communicate with each other. Even though we're all sitting together, they may not know each other's every name in each other's circle and so forth. So whoever that glue is in the center is very important. And when you're talking about ministers and longevity and so forth, it's important to know whether the pastor is expected to be that or not. Pastors will sometimes expect to be that. And you'll need to tell them if that's not their job. Or else you're going to collide on the turf of anchoring <laughs> the congregation. Um, and so I would say, as a pastor, if, if you don't know that you're not that person, you're going to be in big trouble. <laughs> and if you stay there a long time, that may shift. right? And finally, smaller congregations operate the, with a change process that is basically bottom-up through key people. The, there are de facto leaders, 
And sometimes they do not come to meetings. And we can get very oriented to processes that, you know, there's a meeting and then there's another meeting and then there's another meeting. And because those people begin to agree on something, we think we have consensus. And this afternoon, I'm going to work with you about identifying who has the gift of influence. And if they don't come to you, you go to them, just like a community organizer does. They don't wait for people to come to meetings. They go meet people where they are and find out what's on their mind and try to build relationship with them. Um, so it's very important to remember that those de facto leaders, you may not see them at any kind of meeting or dialogue process. But you'll know they were there when it comes time for the final decision. OK. Now, uh, a lot of these dynamics can be affected. Uh, I don't know how many of you this might apply to, but I've been in some small churches that had more than the average amount of endowment and could pay for more staff than they could really support and could pay for more programming than they really otherwise would be able to support as a congregation. That can make some things possible. It tends to make them more clergy-centered, um, but watch out. It can lead to a kind of complacency about sustainability, and it can suppress member ministry that may actually be the key factor for sustainability. If you suppress that, you may be actually killing the potential for the congregation to have a future once those dollars run out. How are we doing? Are you recognizing yourself somewhere in this picture? I need to see some facial feedback here, yeah? Is anything troubling you enough now that it's gonna bug you? I'm happy to, I'm happy to hear it if it does, because I want everybody to be able to move ahead. Okay, very good, very good. Every congregation comes to choice points, but smaller congregations come to a lot of choice points. It's just the nature of the work. And one is, whatever your current clergy arrangement is, whether that's a day a week or whether that's full time or more, or more than one position, ministerial position or paid position, um, you come to a point where you can't pay that salary anymore. And it would frankly be the same as if you can't pay the mu musician package that you've been paying, or you can't hire that person to manage the Sunday school anymore, which may be extremely part-time, but you still may come to the point where you can't have that anymore. Um, so that's the ki one, one kind of choice point. And as I go through these, I'd like you to think about which of these choice points may apply to you at this time or may be coming soon. Those might be ones you'd want to circle. A second is, well, you have the money to have a, a part-time position three days a week. You're good for that. You had somebody who was able to do that. But you are in such a, a small labor market in your particular community that you don't have many potential candidates. And that's a very tough place to be because that's where force fits happen. The only person who's willing to work three days a week is Jane. And Jane is a terrible fit for this church. Yeah. And kind of everybody knows it, and you feel stuck. And boy, do you ever pay for a force fit. Grief and difficulty, sometimes great conflict, uh, and bad feelings all around. You feel bad about yourself as a congregation. The minister feels bad about herself. It's not good. So beware of force fits. You might need some other option until God sends a person. Or you might say, this was a sustainable option at one point, and you know what? The labor market has changed. I'm using very secular language, obviously. Um, and we need a different option if we're going to have continuity of leadership. Um, so that's a choice point. Another is you can't fill essential lay leadership positions. I don't mean if your bylaws call for a board of 14 with an average Sunday attendance of 35, I'd say it's your bylaws that need attention, <laughs> right? But if you ask yourself, you know, set all that brick brack aside, all the historic polity structure, committees, all your old, maybe old assumptions, especially if you were a larger congregation somewhere along the line. Set all that aside and just ask, who actually leads what? 
Who makes what happen? And you count up the number of functional leadership roles. Now, there are people in your congregation that have seven of those, and it'd be good to list all seven, because the next character who comes along the line is probably not going to be able to do all seven of those. Um, you better know what the different ones are, because you need, need to think about different people who really could fill that role if they didn't have to do all seven of them at the same time. Um, so essential leadership positions may require some analysis on your part to really understand how leadership is working today in your congregation. But when you really can't fill those anymore, I mean, there are churches that can't close because there's nobody to sign the document, you know. Um, that, that's an extreme example, but that's what happens if you don't pay attention to this. Can't maintain the building. That's kind of a, an obvious one, and that's, some of your workshops are going to focus on that. Uh, it's one of those crunch points. Although, it can take churches 30 years to recognize that they were already there 30 years ago, and now the building is in such terrible condition, and so much consequent damage has occurred that your options for what happens to that property have, are much diminished. So it's good to recognize it with all of them, but this one early enough that you still have an asset left that you can even talk about. And finally, just because of those sociological dynamics, um, as wonderful and spiritually productive as they can be, uh, smaller congregations sometimes don't have much to offer any prospective member who isn't part of that current sociological network or isn't adopted into it. You know, like the, the eye of the needle parable. <laughs> Not many people are suitable for adoption into the dynamics of your family circle. <laughs> many people are going to bounce off the boundary. And as a small congregation, you really have to accept that. I mean, you, there are things you can do to mitigate it, to be more conscious about how it's happening, and to make your congregation more permeable. But it is still a fact that there is a character to the family system. I mean, this is true in all congregations, but in small congregations, it smacks a newcomer right in the face, that they're either a fit and they're somehow welcomed in uh, as an adopted son or daughter of the church, or they're probably not going to stick around because uh, you're not equipped to offer them, them something. The, the multi-cell congregations sometimes can do a little better because somebody can find a home in a subunit, but they also may run into really not feeling part of the church if that adoption process hasn't happened after a while. So have you got some of these marked? Just how many of you have marked at least one of those? Okay, that's most of you, okay. And um, you, if you didn't mark any, you might say, which one would be most likely to come first, even if it's not now? What might be in the offing? It's kind of, it's quite saddening. It feels saddening to look at those choice points? Because they're so familiar. They're so familiar. I think any group of small congregation leaders that I sat, sit with anywhere in the States or Canada, I think, would, would recognize themselves in this. And actually, I did quite a lot of work in Scotland with the Scottish Episcopal Church. They'd, they'd be having some of the same feelings. Um, what I want to say to you is, uh, uh, once you recognize this, this is not a sentence of doom. If you don't recognize it, that's probably where you're headed, is down that list of choice points. Um, so it's a matter of, of awareness and being able to really step into the opportunities that are there um, and, and welcome some possibilities. So here are some options, and I'm going to go through these pretty quickly for a number of reasons. Many of them may be totally unrealistic for many of you, I know that, so it's a matter of you finding the one or two that seem most promising. Um, it's just a lot of content, and, um, I, and the workshops are going to provide you with the opportunity 
to do something I cannot do, which is to talk about how these actually work here in BC and what some of the other permutations are that I, I didn't even put on my list. Um, and you'll also have a chance for some questions this afternoon. So if it feels a little hurried, it's because I want to make sure that we, we kind of finish an arc of work by 10.30, 10.30-ish, yeah. Um, so that this all fit, the day all fits together for you. Okay, what are the options? I'm just going to name them. Uh, growing to a size where you could sustain full-time clergy, where you'd be operating more like a larger, smaller church than a smaller, smaller church. <laughs> Creating a part-time pastoral position that looks like it could be sustainable in your context. Amalgamate with nearby congregations into a, a single unit on a single site. Join or form a cluster, which involves whatever it's called, is a multiple sites, sharing of staff and sharing of some, at least some programming. Operating with various forms of non-clergy leadership and ending well. Those are the ones we're going to cover, cover, plus a couple variations that might apply to the whole list. So, option number one. Let's not be so small anymore. Let's grow substantially. Um, I would say in 70 to 90 percent of the cases, that's a fantasy solution. There are situations where you have the demographic opportunity and you have the wherewithal in terms of the leadership capacity of your congregation, the adaptability and motivation, um, but that, that is a minority of congregations. Uh, I have been part of such schemes, I have to tell you, that sound like this. If we use all our reserves to hire full-time clergy for three years, we can get big enough to sustain that going forward. Who's going to supply the strategy to make that happen? The minister, right? Probably not. Um, and well, and for, I'll tell you a variety of reasons why, that, why that's a fantasy in many situations. First of all, it might be a fantasy because you underestimate the power of demographics in your community and also changing social norms, how society views religion, how, how they view congregations, how they view your particular religious tradition, um, what people do on Sunday morning, you know, how people communicate, uh, the whole thing. Some researchers say that accounts for at least 60% of your potential for growth is in those facts. No matter how good what you do is, numerical growth, there are many other kinds of growth, but numerical growth is going to be driven or suppressed at least 60% by those factors. Not automatically. You have to do the other 40% really, really well, <laughs> but you need to know you can't ignore those facts. Small congregations tend to way underestimate the amount of budget that's needed to sustain a traditional model. I don't know how many places it's really traditional anymore, but um, a clergy person with a salary and a denominational pension, and you know, who's, who's going to stay a while, let, let's say that. That budget is actually usually a lot bigger than a small church is admitting when they come up with one of these schemes, because they're usually asking, What's the absolute bare bones minimum we could get by with? That's not growth language. Tend to estimate the amount of change, and change equals risk plus pain plus loss, <laughs> that is required to restart a growth curve when it has settled into a long-term trend. This is where numbers can be helpful to you, even though they are very uh, sometimes frightening and depressing, and nobody wants to look at them. When I would get to a new congregation as a, as a minister, I would open up the parish registers and just look at 
Sunday attendance figures, and actually I would, I would plot them out on a graph, which I am actually recommending to you uh, to find some number that seems like it has some correspondence with reality. Membership is probably not it, I'm guessing, depending on how you do that. And to actually plot it over time so that you can just see, see what's happening, which way is the trend going, uh, just a matter of reality. And you know, there are cases where there's a dip that is situational uh, and at least potentially reversible. And so you might view that a little bit differently than most of the congregations I ever worked with. You could go back 30 years. Um, and you know, historically, um, I graduated from college in 1966, and in the US, that was the peak of the demographic surge and the social context, the social support for organized religion. That was about the peak of the curve, the post-war curve. And it was larger in terms of the amount of religious participation, I think, than it had ever been in the United States. So that was, that was hardly the most average benchmark to measure decline against, but there it was. And so everybody kind of expected that was going to go on forever. So, uh, and I'm guessing the curve is somewhat similar in Canada, even if the year is different. Um, so when it's a long-term curve, it has momentum. It is harder to turn around a horse or a car or anything else that has momentum in a particular direction than one that has just started to roll down the hill. You, that's kind of obvious from our knowledge of the physical world. So that's why looking at some statistical history actually can be helpful to you if you don't let yourself get totally despairing and depressed uh, looking at it. Learning to look at it just for information uh, is one of those disciplines of change. And we all tend to underestimate the small percentage of clergy. Some people say it's about 5%. With the right gifts to do a dramatic redevelopment, which means basically establishing a new congregation in the context of an existing congregation, of restarting a growth curve, which is not going to be based on all the assumptions and activities of the downslide. It's going to have to be based on some new priorities, assumptions, and activities. And there's not a lot of clergy. It's actually easier to do this as a brand new start than it is to do it in the context of an existing congregation. That may seem counterintuitive, but I've spent most of my ministry on this side of the equator, and I would say, oh yeah. <laughs> It is harder than a brand new start. So if you think you're ready, um, now this is going to be one of those resources that you're just going to get a taste of. And it may feel, it, 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 it is dense. Uh, it's from a consultant named George Bullard. It is still the best work I know of in a short space. It is, so it's very, very, very compressed. Um, but if you will look in your packet behind the PowerPoints, there's something called Handout B. And it looks like that. If you could look up when you find it, then I'll kind of know who needs more time. So I'm going to just go down this, and I'm going to not, not read every word, but I'm going to kind of cover the points so that you can kind of hear it. And when I hit something and you say, we've got that, you know, circle it, write yes next to it, whatever. And when you come to something that says, oh boy, that's not us, that, that's a, an asset we don't have, you know, you can put a, a no or an X or a question mark, you know, whatever. But you'll only be probably picking out a few things this time through. That's perfectly okay. The three major headings in terms of readiness for redevelopment, and this actually applies to any strategy you choose that requires significant change. 
Any strategy you choose that requires significant change is going to require these, but maybe not with the same intensity as a full redevelopment uh, aimed at a new growth curve. So the three are motivation, adaptability, and skill working with resistance. The key thing about motivation, I mean, people may be intensely motivated to grow, but it may sound like this. We need more young people here to keep things going. I've never heard that. <laughs> We need people to take on these leadership roles. Some of those young people need to run the dinner. Or, 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 or. And if you imagine yourself being the kind of young family that stumbles in thinking maybe some kind of religious context for their kids might be important, and maybe they themselves are actually yearning for community and they haven't even quite surfaced that yet. And they come in and somebody, this actually happened in a congregation I served, a young couple turned up one week and they were welcomed in. Now they happened to be a good psychological fit for the family system. So they were one person in 200 that had ever darkened the doors of that church in the last 10, year, 10 years. But they, for good and for ill, were a good psychological fit. And two weeks later, the guy was the treasurer. If you want to repel 98% of the people who visit, treat them as fresh blood. And the person that you're going to shoehorn in to some perhaps very demanding role where they're going to get chewed up and spit out. So you have not just not incorporated them, you have damaged them and made them cynical about participating in a church. Made them even more cynical maybe than they were when they came or more suspicious about what this is all about. So this is serious moral business. And you're not a horrible person to admit the reason I want new people is to keep things going longer for me. And you know, I really don't have a vision for what's next or how this might serve those other, I don't understand those people out there. I see no way we're going to do it. it. I just, I don't have signs of hope for that. Uh, and so, to be honest, that is my motivation. That doesn't make you a horrible human being. And to give people room to be honest about that is the beginning of wisdom. Because it starts to narrow, there are some options for churches where that really is the primary motivation, and some of these other things also apply. Um, it guides you to better choices than you would make if you were pretending it were otherwise. So it's really important. And in terms of sustained energetic work over a period of years by member leaders, lay leaders, if there aren't seven able energetic leaders ready to work over a period of years on a sustained change strategy, you do not want one of these high intensity change strategies. It's not going to help you, and it's going to set up another cycle of failure. So, you know, being realistic um, and reality testing a little bit this over time before you jump into hiring the minister who's supposed to, you know, double the congregation, um, that may not be as frequent a fantasy as it was 20 years ago but I imagine it's still around here and there. And then adaptability, absolutely essential, actually for all change processes, but especially for the very intense ones. Your, your, your core of leaders, even the people beyond the seven, the next seven, and the ones who are actually doing the flowers on Sunday, and the ones who are making the coffee, and you know what seem like uh, uh, 
you know, maybe they're not on the council, but you better know <laughs> that if something is going to be asked of them in terms of changing the way they do it, it's going to be disruptive and, and they're going to have to make a commitment to it. So gauging the adaptability and the willingness to fail and learn and try again. Most congregations go into some new scheme all or nothing, make it or break it. You know, we're going to do this and it either works or we die. Well, you don't get anything in one. It takes you two or three or four efforts of experimenting with different relationships with your community, um, you know, different alternatives for your church. It takes experimentation, as Allison has underlined so well for us. Um, so, uh, again, that's something that really, really to gauge honestly. And if, uh, I'll, I'll use a, a word that's familiar for my body, if your body is a little, is very arthritic, which is to say the joints really are painful and stiff, that's not willful resistance necessarily, that's just the way it is. That's where people are in their lives and in their personal experience of church. And you wouldn't ask a severely arthritic person, you know, to jump up and down for you. <laughs> um, and there's an emotional and spiritual version of that. There are better choices for a congregation that is um, strategically arthritic. <laughs> Let's put it that way. You want some of the lower intensity choices. It helps you to know that. And finally, skill in working with resistance. And this is a tough one. I mean, there's lots of things you can teach people in a few courses. And then there's skill in working with resistance, which is like this lifetime, never finished vocation. And if you don't have some people who have embraced that as their never finished lifetime vocation, and have a lot, they, you know, they're pretty thick skinned, they don't take things personally, uh, they're able to hear a challenge, and even though it was hard to hear at the moment, you're kind of annoyed with the person, you're able to go back and find the information that was in that objection that can really help you find a realistic strategy. But boy, it, it, it takes a set of gifts, and it also takes margin in your life. There are people sitting here, and there are people in your congregations who have those gifts, but they do not have the margin in their life right now to be putting energy into the exercise of that kind of leadership. Somebody in their family is dying. They've just lost their job and they, they've got to find a way to hustle back an economic life for their family. Um, they're emotionally burned out and depressed from life circumstances, genetic disposition, you know, all the things that happen to us. It's both knowing who has those skills, but who has enough margin in their life to actually be able to exercise those skills as leaders. So just make a couple notes, if you haven't already on this page, make a couple of notes of something that seems to apply. Either more positively, oh yeah, we, we, we've got that, or more negatively, oops, I think that's more us, so we should take note when we, when we consider options. Okay, now that, that's a really dense piece. How are you doing with that? Is there any burning question? that will really make it hard to go forward if you don't have a chance to air it. Yes, Allison. <laughs> um, I'm aware that in the, the adaptability um, section, the phrase willing to fail, learn, and try again is really important, but especially the fail part. Like I often meet with groups where it's like, yeah, we want to learn and we'll try things, but really embracing some things are actually not going to work, mm -hmm. is, a, is of that phrase, like that, that's tough. And I feel like in our church, we, we don't have a lot of experience with learning from experiments that don't turn out exact, I mean, that don't yes. necessarily bear the fruit we imagine. Right, so the, 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 fa the fail part of fail, learn, and try again is really tough. The longer the 
decline curve, if that's what you're facing, um, the more the feeling of failure becomes embedded as a, an overall climate, and therefore the risk of failure goes up and up and up and up. Uh, I was mentioning to somebody in the last two days, three days, that my city of 60,000 was a, um, one of the mill cities of the Merrimack Valley. In the 1910s, it produced more shoes than almost anywhere in the world, um, and um, w was pretty much in decline from the 20s onward, jacked up again. World War II needed a lot of things stitched, canvas stitching, so they transferred that equipment to canvas stitching for military goods. And then the decline that was already happening really started in earnest after World War II. And uh, it took me a while to realize that all this negativity I was hearing is like, oh, this is really awful to hear people talking about the city this way and talking about this will never happen and we tried that. And uh, this is in my community, not in the church. Um, and um, at some point it dawned on me, 50 years of decline leaves scars and makes it hard for people to hope, and makes it hard for people to believe that anything new is really worth trying, lest we actually depress ourselves further, that we tried yet again and failed to have something positive happening in our city. When you think about what, what is the cost of failing, and fortunately there are some people who are able to step beyond that and um, recognize, at least for them, they're able to operate that that's not the end of their psychological self-esteem. Um, and in fact, they can turn it into self-esteem by pulling out those learnings and getting on to the next thing. Uh, one of the, I think it's one of the business dicta, uh, fail quickly and get on with it, um, you know, which is to say, try a small version of it and see how it goes. So that if it's, if it's a total bust, it doesn't mean you don't do it again, but you have then some data. Well, the way we did it didn't work. So the next time we tried it, we certainly shouldn't do the same thing again, probably. We, you know, let's try another version of it, see if that goes any better. But not making such a huge investment from day one before you have done something that reality tests uh, your premise of what you think might, might connect with your community or with new people. So part-time pastoral positions. How many of you are in situation, the, the congregations, that have a part-time pastoral position? Ah, not as many as I guessed. OK, maybe a quarter of the group, a fifth? Alice, yes. you have to ask how many do not have clergy. Yeah. Oh, oh, OK. How many don't have clergy? Oh, that's a few more. Good, good, no, important, important. Yes, here I, I am talking about a compensated pastoral position or ministerial position. So this is a good option to look at if you can't carry a full-time salary. Definitely it ought to be on the list, probably. But there are some typical challenges, especially when you're moving from full-time and perhaps clergy who stayed around for a while to part-time. Uh, one is, it's really hard to adjust the expectations. No matter what the position description says, the ministry description says, it is really hard not to expect that minister to show up for everything that the other one did and you know, lock the door at night like the other one did. You know, it, it, it's a tough go, and it takes a very resilient clergy person to make it through. Um, as I mentioned, except in the densest metro areas, there may be very few candidates and you would be in the danger of a force fit. This can work, and I've referenced there, Small Strong Congregations by Kenan Callahan. Did anybody know that book? It's an oldie. It's an oldie, but it is very appreciative of small congregations and how they work and what they are at their best. So I really recommend that book. And so he talks about, I'm going to call them kind of happy, pastor-proof congregations, right? Where the members are just adept at doing the ministries. 
you know, whatever it is that needs to be done, pastoral visiting, you know, organizing his Sunday school, you know, whatever it is, you know, but for a few things maybe. They really know how to do the, that themselves. They've probably been through long transitions anyway and have run the worship too and have kind of done everything. Um, and they're very good at figuring out what are the gifts of the current clergy and of not worrying too much about their foibles. Oh, well, you know, this one doesn't want to use that book. You know, this one is ferocious about inclusive language, and we weren't that what you said, oh, all right, all right. You know. <laughs> we, can, we can live with that. They'll be gone after a while. We can, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, th there are congregations that kind of have a history of self-reliance and of a, um, a way of utilizing clergy presence without, without being excessively dependent on it or excessively reactive to it, right? It also means they're not going to be excessively reactive to the bright ideas of the new clergy, nor are they going to be all that happy if the new clergy want to take charge of everything. And newly ordained clergy can have a very hard time in these places if they are needing to exercise oversight uh, you know, that, that's sort of what they think they're supposed to be doing and leading and, and trying out those skills, you can overdo it in a congregation like this and actually create unnecessary friction and hostility. So seasoned clergy work better in these roles than brand newbies um, who, who have different needs for personal and, and vocational development. And so if, if you think you might be one of those congregations, Callahan has a nice little set of questions to ask yourself to assess whether you have some of the strengths of a congregation like this. Um, a variation on that is um, sharing clergy but nothing else. Um, that is a part-time position that is also shared with another church in the US that sometimes was called a yoked charge in some systems. If geography permits, it can seem like the simplest strategy to minimize change. However, um, Sunday schedules, of course, are affected because there's only one body <laughs> that has to be shared between two Sunday morning schedules and holiday schedules. Um, after one of the worship services, the clergy aren't going to be around because they're going to be going to the other one. Um, the two congregations involved may have a history of competition. And so at least one of them always feels cheated. Um, and clergy tend to find this pretty wearing and unsatisfying, in case, in case, unless you happen to find two of those happy pastor-proof congregations you know, nearby each other. I, I wouldn't bank on that for my own vocational health. But, <laughs> um, you know, it, it's not that it can never work, but these are common experiences. A third option, uh, amalgamation, sometimes called merger in the US, um, where nearby congregations, and nearby in Canadian terms, <laughs> um, they uh, actually join together on a single site, usually the site usually of one of the existing congregations. And they either have or they're working toward having a unified program, a unified leadership structure, and some version of a new name. But not all amalgamations are the same, and it's very important to know if any of those has support, which one has support. Because if you're guessing wrong, you could be in trouble. The first is called a continuation merger, the second is called a rebirth merger, and the third is called a, an absorption merger. And this is not on your printed slide. You might want to write this down. This is the work of a church consultant named David Raymond. Um, your next slide does have um, a website on it, but it doesn't have his name. His name is David Raymond, and I found his work exceedingly helpful. So, not surprisingly, <laughs> in continuation merger, the goal is maximum continuity. <laughs> so the name usually includes an and. Uh, you know, Trinity Church and St. John's. If it was in the Episcopal Church, it would probably sound like that. So those long and names, you know, we don't want to lose either, either identity. 
It may be very tough to choose, choose which site, and that may actually prevent it from ever happening, because we're waiting for the other congregation to give up and come here. Um, <clears throat> decisions about staffing are often tough. Uh, you know, who, whose minister do we keep? You know, all those, all those questions. Uh, not only minister, but whatever other paid positions you might have. And maybe most telling, the focus is on internal integration, which is important. If you're doing this, you really do need to give a lot of energy to internal integration. But you're not focusing on external invitation and service, which is what has you on this curve to start with. And so you know, it has limitations, which we'll see in a moment. Then there's the rebirth type of amalgamation which is the attempt to create a new and growing entity uh, that is appropriate to the current context. So you're trying to put together several congregations as the seeds of something that's going to be new and it's not going to look like any of them. So it, these work best and they're most successful when there's a new to them site. You might be buying somebody else's old church but it's nobody's existing property. And it, it's presumably in a location where you think you can do ministry, that, that would be what you'd want to choose. Um, uh, and a new name that is not any of the existing names, so that it's clear to everybody, continuity is not the big focus, success at a new emphasis of ministry is the focus. And so you choose new staff, to fit the new mission focus. And very frequently congregations want to compromise that, and usually it's a mistake. Um, and the same emphasis for lay leadership roles. That needs to be reshaped around the new mission. And there's a recognition in that rebirth scenario that some people may not make the journey with us. The, the new thing just may not be anything like what some of the long-term members want to be part of in their life today. And that's just, that just goes with the territory. And then there's a third kind that people often don't even want mentioned, but it's actually quite important. Absorption, or sometimes it's called adoption type of amalgamation, where the, it's anchored by a somewhat larger, more viable congregation, hopefully one that's on a uh, at least a small growth curve of its own, or at least some really well-established stability. Um, and that amalgamation takes place on their site, under their name. And when I work with this setting, I say to the larger church, do not change your name unless you have a mission strategy reason for doing so. Do not change your name just to accommodate the 20 people coming from down the street. You will harm your ministry, and so they may not be coming into a viable unit anymore. That's no service to them. I mean, they may not like you not changing it, but you're not doing them a service by diminishing your viability in your community. Members of the smaller congregation basically join the larger church and engage with its ministries, and they kind of need to understand that's what they'll be doing. The, it's helpful if the negotiation asks the smaller unit to bring along one sacred object, so you accommodate a font, a cross. Um, one church brought along an anchor because their name was Hope, so that went outside the, the building. And maybe one ministry activity. So a small church in the U.S. might be collecting backpacks at the beginning of the school year and filling them up with school supplies and giving them out to children in the neighborhood. That's the kind of ministry that would transfer well to a larger, more viable unit. And even maybe this church, the people from this church maybe are the ones that run it because they know how to do that. They have the relationships. But you know, nothing that's going to twist around or um, stress, you know, distress, the basic mission strategy of the larger unit. It's very important in advising the larger unit to remind them that's their job, is to hold firm on their mission strategy. So David Raymond uh, analyzed Lutheran data, US Lutheran data nationally, over I think a 20 year period. And here's the likely results of those three types based on this historical picture 
for Lutherans. For continuation mergers, so blue is the number that we're growing after 20 years. Uh, that was 18%. Um, okay, so you know, less than one in five were growing after 20 years. Uh, about a third were stable. One in six maybe was in decline. And well over a third had closed. That's the record of the continuity mergers. And if you, you know, based on what I said about momentum, this is about what you would expect. If both places were on the same decline curve with similar momentum, you would expect the momentum to continue. In fact, it's, a, it's an actual miracle that as many are growing as, as are. And they probably had some other factors uh, in play. In terms of the rebirth type merger, uh, now you can see that um, more than a third were growing, uh, about the same number were stable, uh, a smaller percentage, uh, that maybe 20%-ish, um, were declining, and none had closed in a 20-year period. Now that's going to be a smaller number of congregations. Most are not up for this hike up the mountain. And then in terms of the absorption mergers, uh, a large majority had grown, uh, about a quarter had uh, remained stable, uh, none had declined and none had closed. Now that's not a prediction that it couldn't happen, but that's, that is the best data I've ever seen comparing a track record somewhere of, of these strategies. So uh, it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, with continuation, you've got about a 50% chance of stability or growth, with growth much less likely. With rebirth, you, rebirth you've got a 75% chance of stability or growth. With absorption, about a 100% chance, but a cost to the smaller unit of being able to let go of some things. Um, they are all disruptive. So the question is, what fruits will you reap from that disruption? Um, option four is to join, a, for, join or form a cluster. Um, Lutherans I worked with in the upper Midwest of the states call that regional ministry. Uh, so in that respect, you have multiple sites, and the, those sites generally keep their own names. They have a staff team that they share, and there's all different formulas for how they're shared around. Often it's a rotation, uh, but sometimes not. Um, they have some shared programming, usually based on the best gifts of each local site. Uh, youth ministry typically will be done by one of the units to get enough kids and enough leadership to, to make it work. And um, renewable covenants among the partners with a, some kind of time, time frame. The benefits, you can create much better staff positions and attract capable staff. Uh, at least in the states, this is a more viable call <laughs> and one with a little more stability because the covenants have a time period on them. Um, staff teamwork is a huge plus for the clergy in reducing isolation and creates a, a bigger range of gifts for the congregations. Uh, the cluster director is often located in the largest or most central unit. It, there is an extra layer of administration and social complexity and some members of the church's bond identify themselves with the cluster community, and a good many do not. They still see themselves just as part of their own congregation. The periodic renewal process can be very stressful, but it also allows for adaptation. It builds in a time of check-in and adaptation. Option five, to operate with non-clergy leadership, like lay, licensed lay worship leader, local sacramental <coughs> elder would be some names for that. In the Episcopal Church, there are canonical names for these options in terms of you know, different, different clergy um, arrangements. As with other options, it can be extremely hard to adjust expectations that are left over from a paid clergy leadership model. And therefore, this requires really excellent systems of training and accountability, both for the person and for the congregation. Any given region regional unit, I think, needs to make an honest assessment. If they're going to invest in this, they need to invest enough that there's a real system in place. Because without that, the 
people being raised up to function in these roles are going to pay a price. And then sometimes the congregations are going to pay a price because they have no way of renegotiating with that person. The, the, the human dynamics are too difficult and they feel stuck with the arrangement, even if it's not working. The local sacramental elder models often put a very strong emphasis on creating a local ministry team, not just a single person, with different functions, different pastoral and leadership functions, um, in order to address that Lone Ranger temptation. And so in that way, it can be stronger than a sol solo clergy, if that's done well. So that's one of the advantages of this. And there is a feeling that the community is doing the community's ministry, the, the faith community. And that, that can be a very strong thing if it's well-resourced. Okay, so a couple of variations on all of these. Um, what's called shared ministry, which means multi-denominational. That's not easy uh, because of the cultural differences. Uh, I think obvious things like frequency of communion, but probably some subtler things like views on authority um, that can be slightly different between a hierarchical Episcopal system than a congregational system, I hear. <laughs> um, and um, it's very dependent on the character of the, of the pastor um, and the capacity of the congregations to manage change and difference. Uh, and sometimes one of these will work because there's a particular minister who can pull it off, and then you can't find another one who really has the gifts to do it. But it, it can, as you'll hear in the workshops, can be very creative. And then any, in any of these, you might be thinking about divesting property in some way. Uh, selling and then renting a smaller space, maybe, maybe some of the same space back. Um, house church may be connected to a cluster or connected to a larger congregation. Uh, so that's a, a worshiping unit that maintains its identity, um, but kind of has support and accountability from a larger fellowship. Um, and if that's working well, that's the best way to do this so that people aren't out there disconnected or on their own. It can be a good tactic, but you have to ask yourself, in service of what goal? Why are you doing this? Is it just uh, 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 keeping going as long as we can until we close? That's not immoral, but if that's really your expectation, you need to be honest about it so that people don't get chewed up trying to make something else happen when you have no intention of doing that. What ministries are you trying to maintain? in this strategy and using those resources? And what will be your source of support and accountability um, if you go this somewhat more radical, radical route? And then the final option, end well, just like I need to do in another half minute or so. <laughs> um, a thoughtful ending can definitely affirm life, and I have seen that happen. Um, sometimes you hear about significance of your congregation that you would never have guessed if you can really plan an ending when there's still people around to participate in it and to hear and to receive the thanks from others in the community who have appreciated this ministry over the years. In fact, some churches, they hear all that and they say, wait a minute, why are we closing? And then they remember, oh yeah, we know why we're closing. <laughs> all that's true, but it's not going to be true anymore. And that's just, you know, that's the way life works, just like someday I'm going to be dead. <laughs> uh, you know, this ministry may have just come to the end of its God-given life. It can be a relief to admit that we actually don't have the energy for any creative options, and we certainly don't want a creative leader pressing us to change. Not, you know. <laughs> to, to just admit that can be very freeing, and everybody takes a big breath of relief. Even though it's, it may be filled with grief, it's still a big relief. Um, can be a time to really celebrate intensely what's been good and holy, give thanks, and perhaps bestow some legacy on a ministry that fits our values. And of course, you have a region that's ready to help you shape that. Um, and a time to acknowledge what's ending, if you, to, to really take the time and put the energy into shedding the tears and helping each member think about what emotional and spiritual connections do they need and where are they going to find them now. So I think that maybe, uh, there's the six again. I just want to make sure that you've collected what thoughts do you want to make sure you have note of before you leave this presentation. Make a note of those. 
Um, it might even look like this. Which three of those would you like to learn more about? Looks like many of you have got those. I can see you taking a breath. So for the moment, let it be. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.